The following interview was conducted with uh, Jonathan W. Amy, Professor Emeritus of Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, uh, March the 29th, uh, 2010 at his home in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Amy, and thank you. Let's well, start off, uh, tell us where you were born and your parents, early years. Uh, I was born in Delaware, Ohio, where my father, Ernest F. Amy, was a professor of English and uh, his wife, my mo mother, Teresa Say Amy, uh, was <coughs> a very diligent housewife. Uh, there was one younger brother who died at birth. I was born on March 3rd, 1923. A good day and a good year. My early schooling uh, started out with uh, Mrs. Kitchen's kindergarten, uh, where some of us uh, continued on all the way through college uh, and became close friends throughout those years. Uh, I graduated from high school in uh, Delaware, Ohio with interest in science, uh, with interest in mathematics and chemistry and physics. And during that time, I got very interested in sound in both the playing of sound, these were the days of 78 RPM shellac type records, and <clears throat> in the recording of sound. Uh, recording was often done on wax type of uh, transcription uh, material. And that interest uh, led to uh, a, a little company with one of my friends where we built and installed uh, sound systems in fraternity houses, funeral parlors, a few homes. These were the days of what we would call perhaps medium fi, except uh, they really were state-of-the-art for that particular time using vacuum tubes mm -hmm. and lots of transformers. Uh, following <coughs> high school, uh, I enrolled at Ohio Wesleyan in a joint program <coughs> with MIT. This was a program that was sponsored by Bell Labs, and I was to go three years at Ohio Wesleyan and two years at MIT and get degrees from both schools when it was completed. In the summer times, uh, I was to work for the Bell Telephone Company, uh, installing telephones, climbing poles, learning the mechanics of the whole telephone system. And when the program was completed, <coughs> uh, presumably employment uh, awaited in the Bell system someplace. That would have been a lovely program to meet my interest, uh, except uh, Pearl Harbor started uh, us on a different path. And I was a freshman, uh, well remembering uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the 
whole question that came up then about the future of young men who were of military service age. The part that I came up with uh, involves the fact that I was basically a pacifist. I hated guns. I didn't think I could ever shoot anybody. And so the question was, how could I serve with that philosophy? And so I looked around and thought that with my interest in electronics that I could be a radio operator on a merchant ship. I really didn't mind being shot at. I just didn't want to have to shoot it at anybody else. And so that was what I did. And I went enrolled in the U.S. Maritime Service, which meant, first of all, that I was enrolled in the U.S. Coast Guard and in the U.S. Navy Reserve, as well as the Maritime Service. So I was involved in all three for a period of about five days. My f first boot camp training was at in Brooklyn, New York at Sheepshead Bay. Then I went to radio school in Huntington, New York, out on Long Island, in the old Otto Kahn uh, mansion. The beautiful ballroom was turned into a room where we learn code. And you had 60 cadets in there uh, going through the learning process of, of Morse code. Following that, I went to uh, Sheepshead, I went from Sheepshead Bay to uh, uh, Gallops Island in Boston Harbor. And Gallops Island was the radio training school where we continued to learn the mechanics of code and increase our speed. We learned the theory of the radios we would be using and we had a chance to spend occasional weekends in the city of Boston. That was quite an experience, and I soon learned that the best place to stay, to spend the night in Boston, was the Milk Street Police Station. You could go there as soon as you went ashore and reserve a room, and you could store your luggage there, whatever you had, and it would be safe, and it was quiet, and it was sanitary, and it was free. All four, four out of four, huh? <laughs> so that was how I spent some weekends. I uh, managed to get not only <clears throat> the required radio licenses for shipboard communication, but also to uh, get uh, telegraphic licenses and telephone licenses, which were commercial licenses and enabled me later on to work in a commercial uh, radio station after the war. Uh, I was commissioned a uh, ensign at the time of graduation and assigned first to the American Mariner, which was a training ship, and then uh, started in through bookings out of New York in uh, merchant ships carrying cargoes, uh, first of all to Great Britain, and 
was then later on uh, throughout the whole world. So four years were spent at sea uh, in the, not only the American Merchant Marine, but I was also joined a ship with a captain and first mate and chief engineer uh, to a takeover, a, a American tanker, which was under lease, land lease, to the British, uh, who became a British Navy fleet tanker, and sailed mainly getting oil in Abadan at the head of the Persian Gulf, and going to India, Ceylon, African ports, Mombasa, Durban, and that part of the world. We were involved in the invasion of Burma as a support tanker and also hauled oil back through the Suez Canal to various Mediterranean ports. Uh, it was one of these wonderful experiences that I've had in my lifetime. Thoroughly enjoyed what I was doing, uh, but not necessarily want to repeat it again. <laughs> Some of the bad things I've managed to put pretty much out of my mind, and I do very well with that until something comes along and refreshes my memory. Often these are films of various kinds that somebody said, gee, you ought to be interested in this. And it's the kind of thing that brings nightmares back. And the type of thing that I'd rather not do. Mm -hmm. So that gets me up to the end of World War II. And we'll go on to your next question. Let me ask you point. one question. Did you get any short, did you have any leave to come back to the States during all of that travel time, all those years, to visit your family at all? or? Yes. Oh. Uh, some trips would be fairly short, fairly short. Uh, could be as, as little as six weeks time. Uh, we uh, uh, had <coughs> a ship which uh, actually hit a mine and the ship was, you were on? The yes, ship, yeah. was damaged. It was a ship that was full of wheat and the wheat got quite wet and wet wheat uh, in a steel ship will expand so that the ship was badly damaged and we did manage to get into London at the time and got into a shipyard there where they could patch it a bit. Uh, that ship was taken uh, as part of the invasion fleet, fleet at Omaha Beach and uh, actually sunk uh, to make a breakwater to try and give some protection. The, the sea was running quite high at the time of the invasion. And it, it actually was delayed three days while they hoped the sea would calm down. Uh, and that was then the beginning of a very long trip of almost a year before I got back to the States. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I did have time to come home. Okay. Well, uh, one other question. What about the size of the crew? Was it a large ships that you were on or average? Well, these three? were Liberty ships right, for the okay. most part. The Liberty ship is a little over 300 feet long. Uh, it displaces 10,000 tons. Uh, has an old three-legged steam engine in it that will go all of about 11 knots in a dead calm sea with the wind behind you. Uh, but uh, we made almost uh, 3,000 of them, 2,900 and something, in three years' time in the United States. It 
it really made a sizable difference in the war to have these ships available. Mm -hmm. There are three of them still available, still in commission. And one of them, the Thomas O'Brien from San Francisco, actually went back to the anniversary of the Normandy invasion and sailed back with some of the original crew. The original crew consisted of two parts. There was a Navy gunnery crew on board. We had uh, two cannon, uh, one five inch on the stern, one three inch on the bow. We had uh, six uh, machine gun turrets for anti-aircraft use, which probably did more damage to neighboring ships in a convoy than they ever did to the attacking aircraft, but uh, it gave a sense of that, that one could do something. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the commercial crew uh, consisted of uh, a captain, a first mate, a second mate, a third mate, a chief engineer, a first engineer, a second engineer, a third engineer, a uh, radio officer, and sometimes some help in a uh, second radio officer. Uh, many times I was the only one there. A series of cooks and a series of seamen. And so that it was divided to about, uh, about 35 uh, Navy uh, crew and about an equivalent amount of, of seamen sure. on, on, on board. Good, okay. Well, let's talk about uh, your career path before you came to Purdue. After the, this would have been after the well, war then. I came back to Ohio Wesleyan and I still had a couple of years of work to do to finish. Uh, I took courses in the summertime at our summer school in Bayview, Michigan, and I'd taken some courses there before the war. Uh, courses in calculus and, and physics and uh, <clears throat> a, a drama course. We had a summer theater there that uh, was very interesting to me. I also worked in the park there, taking care of the uh, of the shuffle boards and the bowling alleys and the bowling courts and some of the tennis courts and that type of thing. So it was a busy time. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it, yeah. <clears throat> uh, the, while I was uh, at Ohio Wesleyan, uh, I had a chance to build a recording studio, which and where I, I learned a great deal about the recording of sound. I had thought about this all the time I was at sea, and I, th I felt that that there was a much better way to record sound than we were doing at the time. And after graduating from Ohio Wesley, and I thought I'd like to pursue this, and I needed to know something about plastics, and I needed to know something about uh, electrochemistry, of which I knew nothing. And the question was, what graduate school do you go to to learn these things? And I had thought, I was married at that time, we had no children, but I thought that we should be far enough away from home that you didn't go home every weekend <laughs> but we should be near enough to home that you could go home if you wanted to. And so 
uh, that was one of the ways of, of getting involved with Purdue. Ohio State would have been a, a reasonable place to go, but I almost could have lived at home and gone to Ohio State, which was 22 miles away. Uh, we looked at Western Reserve in Cleveland, and that was a kind of fit these criteria. Uh, Henry Haas, who was head of the chemistry department at Purdue at the time, uh, was one of my father's uh, uh, students at Ohio Wesleyan. And uh, the two of them they had always had some things in common in terms of language. Uh, my father was very interested in language. He worked on the Oxford Dictionary for several summers uh, and between the second the First World War and the early 20s. And uh, Henry Haas was the son of a, of a preacher who was very interested in language. And so Henry was a stickler for the exact definition of words. But that connection was such that uh, when I applied to Purdue, Dad wrote a letter to Henry and told him what I wanted to do, and, and he made a place for me to come over. So that's how I got mm -hmm. to Purdue as a graduate student. Okay. About what year would that have been? That would have been 1940, uh, the fall of 1948. Okay. Yes. Fall of 48. Okay. Where did you and your wife live when you came? So how was well, there wasn't much housing available at that time. And we looked at the situation and we ended up buying a house trailer, which was a prairie schooner that was 23 feet long. And I think that was from the trailer hitch to the back of the trailer. And it had a it had a bedroom and a and a kitchen and and uh, a couch and a little place where we ate. And there was no bathroom in it. Oh wow! And uh, there was provision for running water if you could find a hose someplace. Uh, you could run the water in. The question was, what happened next? <laughs> That's a challenge. Uh, so we came to <coughs> West Lafayette, uh, pulling the trailer, and parked the trailer and started looking at trailer parks. There were places we could go, and we came out to the Maples Trailer Park on, which is now on, on Sagamore Parkway. At that time it was 52 and was a two lane road. And uh, George was the proprietor. And we talked to George and he said, yes, we have a nice space right down here and there were maple trees above it, and there was a little area back behind that he said you can use for a garden. And uh, there were trailer. There was a trailer on one side of it, and a couple of more vacant lots on the other. And he said the nearest water connection is uh, down the uh, the road. Uh, about uh, five lots, and I have so I have shovels that I'll give you, <laughs> let you use, and uh, this is where you can get pipe, and you can just lay your water line right down along the edge of the road, and. Uh, well, this another boy moved in at the same time, so we had two people to dig a water line. 
And so we laid the water pipe and got the thing connected up to the trailer. And uh, the trailer had a little gasoline stove in it. And uh, I had gotten an old aircraft tank that I mounted on the front of the trailer to hold uh, oil for uh, a little drip pot type oil heater inside and we were really very cozy at that point and I had built a scooter before I came over my last year at Ohio Wesleyan and it was a <coughs> a scooter a three-wheeled scooter with a uh, lawnmower type motor in it. And I'd actually put a little differential uh, gearing system in the back two wheels so that it, uh, the wheels could be fairly far apart and not scrub as they went around the corner. And it had a a bicycle wheel type on the front and and a welded frame that I put with some uh, with some sheet metal around it some aluminum and it worked fine and I could go back from the trailer park to school in that and I could go back and forth that way but of course in Lafayette it rains and this was very much an open scooter. <laughs> so the question was, what can you do about, about that? And I found uh, out at the junkyard uh, a nose cone for a B-24 uh, bomber, which was a plastic uh, nose cone with a laminated safety glass uh, in the center part, which is where the bomb site went. Uh, that was a high-grade optical <laughs> system. And put that up in front and then got some canvas and we sewed up a, a top for it. So uh, with some curtains on the side, and then this was a two-seater. Two of us could go. Uh, curtains on the side, we could put back and forth to school. I love it. That's great. And uh, that was uh, that. That really worked, and it saved uh, driving the car and finding a parking place for the car and. There were, by that time, there were 10,000 students in the Purdue campus. And we had our choice of three places to live. Uh, many people had to leave their families at home because there was no housing that would take uh, multiple people. So we're very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Was uh, there grocery shopping close by where you... Yes, uh, there was a little grocery store and gas station mm. right adjacent to the trailer park. Oh, okay. And that worked out very well. Uh, I was assigned to teach, uh, assist in teaching physical chemistry with Herschel Hunt. And Herschel Hunt was basically a farmer who taught chemistry. He also raised Hereford cattle. And his farm has been cut in two by uh, 65, the interstate just north of West Lafayette. And Herschel would take his assistants and give them the opportunity to learn how to put up hay in the springtime. And so I became very adept at 
loading hay onto the wagon and then taking the wagon to the barn and hoisting the hay up into the loft, the loft. of the barn. And I felt like I was learning farming at the time. Uh, During that time, uh, I made a lot of equipment for the physical chemistry laboratory. Uh, I did my, uh, my thesis work with Thomas de Vries, who was an electrochemist and an analytical chemist. And I learned how to make water baths uh, with precise temperature control from him. And at that point, then we continued and made a batch of them to go in the physical chemistry laboratory. We made glass electrodes. Uh, you couldn't buy, well, you later you could afford, you could buy a pH meter if you could afford one. But we had built these <laughs> units and uh, actually made pretty good electrodes out of them so that our numbers were fairly accurate that we were getting. And so we did a lot of experiments that way, built up the, the laboratory equipment and we had to because there were so many students coming uh, after the war that uh, we had to have classes on Saturday mornings. Uh, we had uh, laboratories, uh, I think we had six laboratories a week. And uh, I don't remember how many recitation sections there were in the physical chemistry course. But all the engineers, particularly the chemical engineers, all of them had to take physical chemistry. And so it, it meant we had lots of laboratories mm -hmm. that had to be done. And it, Herschel was a character. He uh, basically was a farmer. And the students would act like students do. They'd fall asleep in class. Herschel used to love it when somebody fell asleep because he could throw an eraser at them then and he became a very good shot. <laughs> and he'd wake them up and get them up to the blackboard and ask them to explain how to solve this problem or so forth. So he had a way of embarrassing people to the point where they either loved him or they hated him. Hmm. <laughs> then after you finished your master's, you stayed on then for... Well, after I finished my master's, I had learned about plastics. I'd learned about electrochemistry. I'd supported ourselves while we were here. We had one child at that point, and it was time to find a job. And I really wanted to get involved in the recording business. So I went to RCA in Indianapolis and said, I've got a way to record sound, and I'd like to try and develop this. And they... Uh, they were gracious. They said, we don't think that's the way to do it. We'll show you the proper way to do it. And they made me sign a secrecy agreement and took me into their laboratory and showed me how they were recording sound on very thin uh, steel wire that moved through recording heads and playback heads at a very high speed. And during the process of demonstrating this, this was very thin wire. Uh, during the process of the demonstration, the wire broke. And here you had this wire moving at a pretty high speed and suddenly interrupted in its 
spooling up on one spool and unspooling from the other. The unspooling continued and the spooling up stopped. And so we had wire flying every which way. And in the process of this, the fact that it didn't wrap around my neck, I thought was a real act of grace. And so I've been thankful ever since. And they said, well, this is still the way to do it. Uh, we've got a little bit more development to do with it. Uh, and I think that we'll thank you for telling us your method, and we will not offer you a position. So I came back to Purdue, and, and Dr. Mellon, who was my mentor, uh, said, you know, you're disappointed with this, and I know that you wanted to do that, but we have a new professor coming in, coming from Harvard, who wants to build a microwave spectrometer. And he knows essentially nothing about building a microwave spectrometer. He knows how to use it. He knows how to do the calculations. But he's going to need a lot of help. Why don't you stay and help him? And that was my introduction to Walter Edgel, who was the physical chemist from Bright Wilson's laboratory in Harvard who wanted to build a microwave spectrometer. So my job, first job, was to learn how to do that. And I visited uh, the laboratories of the Westinghouse uh, Corporation in Pittsburgh where they were very gracious and showed us their uh, microwave spectrometer. Mm -hmm. And I also visited laboratories at Duke University where Professor Gordy in the physics department was probably the primary uh, mover in microwave spectroscopy in the, in the world at that point. And both gave me the, the idea and the tools to to try to build this. But at that time, the chemistry department had no machine top facilities. And I actually uh, had a small metal working lathe that I brought into the laboratory <laughs> and made a little cart for it, a little table for it, and set it up and machined some of the parts to make the microwave spectrometer. And we actually made one, got it to work, uh, got uh, some structure determined with it on some fluorocarbons, and that was sufficient to uh, get a paper written and get a large portion of a thesis done. Uh, one thing led to another, and the second thing, the uh, companion technique to microwave spectroscopy for structure was infrared spectroscopy, and the companion to that was Raman spectroscopy. And so we ended up building instruments with all of these. And a lot of this was done in conjunction with commercial companies. I soon learned after the microwave one that, that you really can't do all this stuff yourself. You need to get professionals involved, you, uh, particularly when you're dealing with optics and, and uh, <clears throat> something other than just plain lenses. Uh, uh, and we were using off-axis uh, parabolic lenses and uh, parabolic mirrors. And uh, it had to be somebody who could do that. So we worked with Perkin Elmer in uh, Connecticut 
to build uh, what really was the first prison grading uh, infrared spectrometer uh, that uh, <coughs> had been built as a commercial instrument. And <coughs> that one, uh, every one of these things had something happen that could have been catastrophic. That one was in a laboratory in Norwalk, Connecticut when they had a flood and it was on a bench with some tubifores lifting it up off the bench so they could get at the bottom of the instrument. The water came up over the bench. The prism in the in the uh, instrument, it had it was a prism grating instrument, and the prism in the instrument was made of rock salt. Well, rock salt with water underneath it is not a good thing. And so, the engineer who was who I with whom I was working called and said. Why don't we just ship the instrument back to Purdue and you can finish it back there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we got it back at Purdue and, and actually the gratings weren't ruled at the time we we started this thing and it really was a wonderful experience for me to one to be able to work with these professional people who <coughs> These are the people who built the, the Hubble telescope, for instance. And yes, they made a mistake with it, but they knew how to correct the mistake then. And <clears throat> part of what we did was directly related to what ended up in the, in the Hubble telescope. That's nice to know. Very good. 30 years later. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that it, it has been a very good experience for me. And we've been involved in the very beginning of a lot of, a lot of, of instrument development. And during the time that I was a graduate student, uh, gas chromatography, uh, <clears throat> started uh, and some companies got involved with it including the Fisher Scientific Company in, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and they wanted to build one for the Gulf Chemical Company and they needed some help and so uh, I spent some time with Aiken Fisher uh, trying to help uh, with that particular one. And that was a relationship that lasted after I finished uh, graduate school and, uh, and was working at Purdue. And <coughs> that, uh, that led to other commercial relationships and these were built up kind of one at a time uh, always with the idea that they were useful for Purdue either they gave us access to technology they would frequently offered to either give us an instrument or build one for us at a reduced mm -hmm. price if we would evaluate it and tell them what needed to be done, what was wrong with it. Um, and that relationship uh, has continued until this, until last January when the last of these kinds of relationships I have terminated now. And much of the instruments 
instrumentation that we had in the chemistry department were the results of these kinds of things. So professors coming in, they wanted to try and do something. They didn't have the ability or the know-how to to do it to do it uh, and they needed help and right. so we would go in and the group got bigger and bigger and bigger as more and more <laughs> of this was needed and I think that today the group not only services the chemistry department but the whole university as as I tried to do with some of the schools um, and I think that um, there now are 15 or more people professional or semi-professional people within that group who are doing software and and mechanical type things, chemical type things, and and working with the professors and the students, to and the outside world. Uh, we did a lot of training in the way of short courses for new techniques, and and that was a key to a lot of this. We had courses in the summer to teach people how to use computers, mm -hmm. teach chemists how to use computers. And that became the, what is formalized now as, as our chemical instrumentation facility within the department. And it, it's, changed it it's evolved which it should right. right and it's nice to be able to get in on the ground floor and work with it and stay with it and have an impact as well well there were a lot of people who tried to copy it and and set up similar situations at other places at other places and they'd have and they had various success at it and and they've asked uh, they've asked me to help them, at, and I have at, at some places at mm -hmm. Wisconsin and at Stanford and uh, Caltech, particularly mm -hmm. uh, uh, a little bit in Berkeley, but. Um, When there is only one instrument with a certain capability to it, and it's going to be at least a year before anybody else gets one, just because of the time it takes to, to understand them and build them and deliver them. Uh, it means that those professors at Purdue who had access to this had a full year lead on anybody else being able to do what right. what they what, what the they instrument do. would do. Mm -hmm. And NSF was concerned about this, and so part of the agreement to fund some of these programs uh, was that we share the facility with others. And that particularly was true with things like mass spectrometers and nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers, which were very expensive instruments at the time and uh, very few people could justify that sort of expenditure. Mm -hmm. That's not true so much now. As a matter of fact, the department has an airplane right now. 
that uh, they use in collecting samples uh, uh, out of the sky above uh, uh, above the forests and other things, and analyzing what they get. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not as fancy as Harvard's. They have a U-2 that flies over the Antarctic. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's nice to you shared uh, a lot on the instrumentation. And I think... Uh, it appears to me that this might be a good stopping point, don't you think? You think? It's fine. Uh, okay. And then we can, I think we'd like to pick up um, some of your committees and also um, a little bit more, you might think of some more things on the facility, how it came to be, and is it funded, you know, a little more in the current, the last years before you left. And then talk about some of your people, Dr. Mellon, that you worked very closely with. Was Bill Bating or was he another colleague? Yes. Okay, and then John Benyon, I think you mentioned him. Benyon, or was he a? Bynum. Bynum, okay. Yeah. And Fred La McLaverty? Was yes. he another colleague? Yes, okay. well, Fred started the, the real mass spectrometry okay. program. Well, that, the, giving the input, people, their key colleagues that, yeah. um, particularly, and also Dr. Mellon and the other thing you can say that, uh, or I can make the comment, the library is named after him in the chemistry. Yeah, yes. Did he have some input? Uh, how did that come about? He started it. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, he was. He wrote a book on library science. Are you aware of that no. book? Uh -uh. Well, look it up. It's, I will. It's okay. I know. He, he wrote. I told books. you that I did meet him a couple times because he'd come for a birthday or something, and yes. John Pinsalik would yes. have a. We may we may have even been at the same occasion. See. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, chemical li or literature. Oh, the chemical. Oh, I think now you're talking about the chemical literature book of his. Yes, that one. I John did share that with me. He yeah. also wrote, it, that one had about seven volumes, six or seven volumes. He also wrote uh, a book on optical spectroscopy that had, uh, that had several volumes. He was interested in color. And the... Uh, the first recording spectrophotometer just worked in the visible region. And to measure color, you measure reflectance. You don't necessarily measure transmission. Although when you can look through a piece of glass and say the glass is red, well, that's a transmission measurement. But if you're talking about printed paper, that is a re reflection measurement. And it was the reflection measurement that he was interested in. Okay. How do you determine the color of paint on a house or an automobile? Or how do you get the same color of printed uh, chewing gum wrappers, for instance. The red on the Wrigley's double mid, I think it was, the green wrapper with a red thing. That red was very difficult <laughs> to reproduce of the same color month after month after month. And it was very hard to measure because it was a small, uh, small piece. A small yeah. piece. All right. And we developed techniques for measuring that, and uh, that was a real challenge. Uh, but he was very interested in that, and he was very interested in in the 
chemistry of color, particularly as a way of identifying uh, unknowns. Uh, he developed a reagent which was a molybdenum uh, reagent, and these were called heteropoly uh, substances and used widely in uh, clinical analysis. You set up a chemistry which would eventually react with this color forming reagent and it would change color. Sure, I understand. Uh, okay. And it changed color in proportion to the amount of substance that was there. And at one time in the automated uh, chemical analysis which uh, was done by a company called Technicon. And the Autotechnicon was a way of pumping a sample of blood or a sample of a body fluid uh, through a plastic uh, tube. And the plastic tube was pumped with a peristolic pump. A peristolic pump is a series of rollers on the tube that oscillate back and forth and so that you can pump the liquid through. And you put an air bubble in the tube to separate samples. And the air, bumple, air bubble would go through the tube and you'd get the sample plus the reagent which would react and give a color and then the next sample would come along but there'd be an air bubble in between mm -hmm. the two. So that's the way they separated them. It was a very clever way. And that method was actually developed by uh, a man by the name of Leonard at uh, uh, the Cleveland Clinic and I think also he had an appointment at Western Reserve. His brother was head of the civil engineering department at Purdue at the time. This was back in the early 50s. And they were very clever people, both of them. But that uh, at one time, Dr. Mellon's reagents determined over half of the uh, determinations done with the Autotechnicon detector or analysis system. And these were the kinds of things that you'd go give a blood sample and they'd measure uh, creatinine and blood urea, nitrogen, and some of the liver function type right. uh, things. That these charts that you get back, there'd be 12, 12 determinations, say, and that was the ASM 12 uh, protocol. Mm. And uh, he was very active in, in, in that part. Mm -hmm. And he also was very active in, uh, in fabrics and dyeing of fabrics and getting the, uh, getting the dye uh, to consistently have the same color and to fade the same way. Uh, one of his students went to, d went to DuPont as a matter of fact, at one time, as I remember it, five sections of DuPont were headed by his students, his PhD students, in, in various parts of the organization. And one of them went to 
develop the dying of uh, I think that the polyester it was a polyester and I think DuPont called it Dacron I'm not sure of that name but the polyester fi fabric and polyester did not want to dye. It did not want to have the dye stick to it or react with it. And this didn't develop the way that you mm. could do that. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, so he he really was a very interesting man. He lived uh, he lived down the street here from us. Uh, uh, Al and Gladys Wright lived on this side of him. The Von Tobel house is right next to ours, and there's another small house that's been sold several times. And then Al Wright's house, and then the old Mellon house. And the people who live in the Mellon house now uh, are uh, I think they're great grandchildren. Probably some relative of him. Well, it's either a grandchild or a great grandchild. Oh, some, some relative of him. Yes. No, okay, no, and they know. bought the, they bought the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, he painted that house. Uh, Made in the Mist Blue. And Made in the Mist Blue was a color developed for uh, one of the British royalties, and it could have been Queen Elizabeth's She's been, I think, queen long enough that it could have been her or her mother, one or the other, uh, her wedding dress. And Dr. Mellon got a, fa a piece of the fabric. And he then matched the color and painted his house uh. that, that, that <laughs> color. It's uh, been changed sure. since then. But, sure. uh, and it faded. It didn't last very well. Right. This is our stopping point, Dr. Amy. We'll uh, pick it up and uh, continue on.